and thank you. Padmini and uh, Gayatri ji for a wonderful session like always. So Radhe Radhe, good morning, good evening everyone. A very warm welcome to today's edition of Daily Wisdom from Bhagavad Gita. Hope you're doing good. We had a little bit of a break but hope you got some action on the book club launch. So let's get started with today's session. We will, we have a cash up segment coming up as well. So we'll rush through the stuff because we have a lot of stuff to cover and see how far we can go. So let me share my screen. Able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Sick. Okay. So let's get started with our opening prayers. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Aheshwarha, Guru Sakshat, Par Brahma, Tasmai Shri Guru Vedamaha, Vasudeva Sutam Devam, Kamsachanur Mardanam, Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru Radhe Radhe, good morning, good evening everyone. So let's get started with our session for the day. Uh, today we will not have the Soul Soup segment because we have Spiritual Cash Up segment. But nevertheless, I came across this couple of things which I found pretty good. I thought it's worth sharing it in this session as well. So we have $86,400 in your account every day. And if you were to, let's say, dollar ten gets stolen away from it as well, then uh, we don't waste the remaining ones. So this is just to say that there are moments when we'll feel down and upset, but if you let it spoil the rest of your day, then you are frittering away the remaining cash that you have for the rest of the day. So negative sentiments have to be overcome fairly quickly and we don't harbor resentment. Otherwise, we are frittering away all the wealth that we get pretty much every day. And this one is pretty interesting too. So usually in material life, if you're in material life, you know, all these things that you're subjected to, we all know, work is sleep school and dishes and all that stuff but if you're in spiritual life you'll be taken care of it becomes a bed of roses progressively this is how the life usually goes about so anyways let's get started so we'll continue to build on the shloka i don't know how far we can go today i know we introduced four tools today we'll introduce few more with a quick recap and then uh, those to topic topics are a little um, you know needs to be detailed out. So we'll see how far we can go today. So I'm going to recite the shloka and then we'll simply get started. We're not going to take any hands today because we have some content to cover and then I want to give good 30 minutes or 20 to 30 minutes to the, the next segment as well. Ihai vater jita sargo ye sham samya sthitam manaha nirdosham hi samam brahma Tasmad Brahmani te So in this shloka, Lord Krishna is saying that those whose minds are established in equality of vision conquer the cycle of birth and death in this very life. They possess the flawless qualities of God and are therefore situated or seated in the absolute truth. And we have been talking about the practical tools that we can utilize uh, to develop this equality of vision. So as part of that conversation, we will continue. We have spoken about four tools. We will do a quick recap. Pursuing the true knowledge of the scriptures, we see that the faith increases with knowledge, devotion increases with faith, love increases with devotion. And of course, uh, as you keep on attaching your mind to God, detachment is a natural consequence of it. It will start happening all by itself. You have to just focus on doing the plus the minus will happen all by itself. Okay. That is the beauty of this part. Now, uh, sick. 
So this was the first tool. So we need to build knowledge that will lead to faith, will lead to love, and then finally it will lead, lead to surrender. And that is where Bhagavad Gita ends as well, by the way. Sarv dharmam parityajya maamekam sharnam braj. So surrender is a journey of finally doing nothing, but in order for us to reach the state of doing nothing, we have to do a lot of things. Okay. So this is the first tool. The second one we spoke about that except that the material world is temporary, and uh, this is an important one for us to understand because this is where we get hung up every lifetime, right? So we get hung up in, you know, all these drama that unfolds around us and uh, every lifetime we keep on finding that one or two people, okay? If you may create a village, but then there is invariably one or two people you will create in every lifetime that will make you repeat in this cycle of life and death okay it could be your you know kid it could be spouse it could be parents it could be friend sister whatever the case may be there's always that one or two people that we find which actually um, that is all it is needed for us to repeat in this uh, cycle of life and death so and then we need to keep this in mind that this is all is transient or temporary because and nothing belongs to us Anything can be snatched away in a moment. So basically we are, it's a temporary association that we get in a particular lifetime and uh, we should not take it too far in our head. It's like the waves, they rise from the ocean and two waves will rise as you know, if you've gone to the seashore and seen. And then those two waves will part never to get together again or unite again. So that is how the material relations go as well. It is very, very temporary association. It's like a journey. You are on a train, right? With co-passengers, when their station would come, they have to depart because everybody has their own exit ticket. And then you can't accompany them. Neither are they going to stay back for you. The third one, we said feeling grateful for divine graces and gifts. And we said that everybody have something to be grateful about. A rich can say, I'm not poor. Poor is not sick, not physically challenged, not mentally deranged, and finally not dead. So only a dead person is one who cannot be grateful for any anything. But other than that, you'll always have a reason to be grateful for something. And it's a great sentiment to harbor, especially on the path of spirituality. It will keep away the negative thoughts and keep um, fueling the inspiration within you to utilize human life. And then we spoke about difficulties are a blessing in disguise, right? So we spoke about... A diamond is nothing but a piece of coal which is able to withstand extreme pressure for an extended period of time. And the journey from a larva, pupa, all the way to a butterfly, right? It may be troublesome, it may be painful, but it is well worth it when you become a butterfly and soar high. So this is how the journey unfolds. And God um, is he's a perfect sculpture as well. He's also working on us gradually so that we can also you know grow our wings and then take that flight that he expects us to take and he he doesn't he he truly believes in us in that sense let's move on to the next tools that we are going to introduce today the fifth one is associate with a true guru now true saints are like fireballs of god consciousness it cannot happen that we associate with them and we do not feel experience detachment from the mundane or attachment to the divine. So I'm going to tell you some of the symptoms about that, but let's understand about true guru when we talk about, right? So in typically what happens in our journey in a human life goes, goes on like this. I mean, it could be in one lifetime or it could take multiple lifetimes. But I found it's pretty interesting in Dunning-Kruger effect. They say is that when your competence is low, you know, your confidence is pretty high. As you see, this works inversely. So some of the most... Uh, what you call incompetent people will have the highest confidence. Like Einstein had said something. Uh, he had said that, what is the difference between a genius and a stupid person? He said genius has its limits. So the more incompetent you are, the higher your confidence is likely to be. And then until you reach a peak of Mount Stupid. And then that's where you realize that you know nothing. Right. So know nothing and then you have a valley of despair. And then you accept that in all humility and then the slope of enlightenment starts. When you start realizing, you know what, I thought I knew it all, but 
looks like I have I don't know anything. And then in that humility, that uh, dark hour, valley of despair, the light starts coming in. And that is called the slope of en enlightenment. And then it starts stabilizing and until you reach a plateau of sustainability. And then, of course, your competence is increasing now. You might thought, might have thought, you know, uh, you had you were competent previously, but now you're com the true competence is increasing. And then you find a guru at a particular stage. So our scriptures say that, and this is this is the curve. You can go check it out. It's, it's you know used in a lot of corporate setup as well. Uh, and it's a hypothetical cognitive bias stating that people with low ability at a task overestimate their ability. Okay, so this happens to everyone. Uh, but sooner we get out of this, the better it is. And our scriptures say that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Okay, so if you're not finding a guru, we need to prepare ourselves. In due course of time, master has to appear. There's no other way. And God has strategically placed enough masters based on what we are ready for. It's it's our call. When we are ready, when we are ready to receive, the master will appear. Because now we have started serving the purpose of this universe. So master has to appear. Now, let me thicken the plot. Okay, this says when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And then it also says when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And when the student is truly ready, the teacher disappears. Okay, so this also happens. So that's where you should not get disappointed when you get special attention from your guru. You know, guru is looking at you, uh, you know, gently talking to you, patting you on the back, putting his arms around you. People are very happy. And then one day, Guru will walk past you as if you are a complete stranger and people will say, oh my God, what happened? He doesn't care for me anymore. He doesn't, he's not pally with me anymore like he used to be previously. That's not a bad situation to be in. Okay, and then Guru knows that now you are kind of on the way and he needs to focus his attention on other people who need to be eased into this or brought into the fold. So Guru giving you attention is good. But then... If he's giving you special attention to begin with, that means you are relatively new on path, right? It's like a, nurturing a sapling. But once he understands that your root are good enough, strong enough, then he'll disappear. Disappear means then, of course, he'll keep his gaze on you. Guru never leaves you. But physically, you will, you know, you should not get disappointed if Guru's not giving you attention or he's not talking to you as often. In fact, if he starts scolding you, that's even better. That means now you have cut another corner in life. Now people say, oh my God, my guru scolded me. No, it's even better. If he started scolding you, that means you have really progressed on this journey. Now, what are the symptoms of finding? This is another. So when you find a true guru, then it will, the another symptom of it is that you, you will start feeling a natural detachment from this world. You will not play to the drama of this world as, as much as you would have otherwise. That's another uh, symptom of finding a true guru. Okay. So let's talk about some of the indicators of a true guru. There's a saying in Hindi, Pani Pio Chanke, Guru Banao Chanke. So true guru's words are like very impacting. They go deep into the hearts of the listeners. So you would realize this is a very sure short symptoms. It's like a, a hot knife cutting through a butter. It somewhere pierces your heart. Somewhere you said, oh, you know what? It's made sense. That's the first symptom. Then it easily resolves your doubts and dispels your confusions. That quality has to be there. It should, it should not be like the more questions you ask asking, the more it is tying you up in knots. Okay, so you should be able to resolve your doubts because true guru, our scriptures say, should have two attributes, Shrotri and Brahmanisht. So if they are Shrotri, they should know all the scriptures. They should be able to resolve you. And they are Brahmanisht, then of course they have seen the truth. So with these two, these two, um, uh, you know, uh, what you call that uh, armors or not armors, what do you call that? I've forgotten. Okay. These two um, assets that they have, they should be able to resolve your doubts and ease your doubts as well. Now, this is an important one. A true guru will not give his disciple material allurements. If they're engaging you in material allurements, then there is a problem. Right? Because Guruji himself has given up material world. Why? You ask Guruji if you are, they are giving you material, okay, but you get, you know, you get a job, you'll get more money, you'll get promotion, you'll get more world, right? Then one can ask Guruji that if that is something, which is something which is supposed to give me, why did you reject it to begin with? And Guruji will say, because it's poison. 
That's why I rejected it. So if it is poison, then why would you give it to me? So a true guru will never engage you from a material allurement standpoint. They will always be focused on your spiritual growth, which is the true wealth anyways. And then when you start associating with the true guru, you find yourself naturally getting attached to God and detached from the world. We are talking about detachment from the, this is one of the practical tools. So this is a natural consequence of it. When you start getting attached to God, detachment will automatically happen. If detachment is not happening from the world, that means attachment to God is not happening. It is superficial at this point. You know, but you have not practiced hard enough. Uh, and that is why your mind is still getting attached to the world. So when your mind is getting attached to God, 1%, 1% detachment has already happened from the world. And when it is 10%, 10% detachment, 100%, 100%. So it is automatic. So you do you focus on the plus part of it, adding part of it, subtraction will automatic, automatically happen. And one of the symptoms of associating with the true guru is it, this natural consequence of, you know, uh, your mind will get start getting attracted towards God. And then the strongest indication comes from God. He will guide you. You have reached the right person. Something from within will tell you this is this is what it is. So we have to latch on to all these symptoms because it's not easy to find a true guru. Uh, the one that is suited for your spiritual growth based on your past sanskars, based on how far you have come in this journey, based on where your natural inclinations are. But these are some of the yardsticks you can employ, employ to say, you could, this could be the person I was looking for in this life. And when you come across somebody, don't leave them. Okay, that is the, they say that you are reborn at that kid. You may not be uh, reborn physically, but the day you get, meet your guru, that is your another birth. Because now your true journey has started. Spiritual journey has started. Material journey is anyway continuing, right? We are anyway under the spell of Bhut. Big Bhut. It's not even Bhut, it is Mahabhut. Panch Mahabhut, right? So those bhut are there on which make us feel like the, we are this body. But when you meet a guru, he will start taking you closer to your true identity, which is that of being a soul and start aligning to your higher dharma, which is the dharma of the soul itself. So these are some of the indications of a guru. Um, and this topic itself could be any questions, by the way, before I move to the sixth tool. Practice to karam. Any, any questions on this? Anybody has? Because this topic can... Uh, yeah, let's spend a little bit of time for, especially for people who might not have attended our series on uh, Guru. I can, I'm happy to take some questions on that because this is a very important topic. And then we can move on to our spiritual cash up segment. The remaining tools are introduced in the next one because it is Karam Yoga, which could have a discussion in, you know, of its own. But let's spend a little bit of time on this topic. Any questions related to Guru? Uh, rather, rather, Nitin, Dipiji, the question is not related to Guru, but it is the pending question from the last class. Okay, what is the question? The question was, can someone without spiritual knowledge, especially in the corporate sector, how can they have knowledge on behavior and behavior skills if they are not having the spiritual knowledge? Okay, so, no, this is a good one. So, see, all the leadership courses or all the self-improvement stuff, if you have read those books or if you have looked at some of those concepts, where they reach the peak, right? Where they say, I'll, tell, I'll talk about um, some of those concepts because when I was doing my master's, I had the benefit of reading Bhagavad Gita in parallel. All those books are barely scratching the surface of the spiritual principles that we are talking about. Now, they don't need to be spiritual actually to become a... Of course, they will be limited at a, at a certain extent because leadership from a material standpoint, can take you only so far. In fact, the latest mantra in leadership is also saying leadership by servitude. And servitude is what? The soul is jivir swarup hoi nityar krishna ardas, right? So everybody has to serve. So leadership is also waking up to some of the deeper spiritual principles. But if you simply talk about becoming a good leader or a good manager, you can align to you know some of the toned down version of spirituality where you don't have to believe in God and still can be a good person. Right? Good person means operate in sattva, don't be manipulative, uh, have some value system, think of others, um, you know, give credit to people, how to motivate them. So all that is like there's a lot of science behind it and even material science can give you a lot of good inputs. But if you look at that material science also, it is like a toned down version of what spirituality is telling you about. So I'll give you an example like it spoke about there are level 
level one, level two, level three, level four leaders. And uh, I was doing, uh, you know, when I was studying, I was reading about those, right? Level one kind of leaders are there who need uh, their position or authority to, you know, impose themselves on people to get something done. And then level level two is, um, you know, they, they need their authority and that as well. But at the same time, they, they know some of the skills, interpersonal skills as well, how to motivate people. And they know the drivers of their team as well, right? Who can be motivated by what? And then level three was that they get the job done, uh, but then they don't get credit. They share it with the team. The fourth one was the job is getting done and they are not even in the picture. And the fifth one, I think it said that it was more bordering on spirituality where, you know, they do things which would defy logic at times and you won't understand why would they do things like, right? Some of the leaders like Nelson Mandela and people like that, they came in. I don't know if he had a spiritual upbringing or not, but it's like when he was asked, um, you know, when spring box used to be the the face of apartheid, spring box was the team, South African team, their baseball team, and they were called by spring box name. And the first thing he did after becoming president was embrace him. And he said, why did you do that? He said, because if I had not, uh, you know, we would always have that device divide between the the non the blacks and the non blacks, right, or, or Afro Americans. So. Now, why would he do that? Why would he even forget, uh, you know, all, all the atrocities that were uh, he was subjected to for 30 years in prison? In fact, he invited one of the guys who had put him in a pit and urinated on him. He actually invited him to his uh, president uh, ceremony as well. And he embraced him. And the case study which we were going about, you know, the kind of leader said, we can't explain that. And there's no way to explain why would somebody behave like that. So that's where, you know, I was like, okay, Bhagavad Gita explains, you go beyond certain things. Material world, you can't explain, right? Why would somebody do that? So yes, spirituality will take, give you an edge, a lot more depth, I would say. But even if you are, you know, doing the toned down version of it, you don't believe in God, you want to be good. Uh, and there are enough things to talk about, you know, how, how you can uh, think about others, be em empathetic, compassionate. You can focus on those qualities itself and that can make, make for a good leader as well in corporate setup. But yeah, it's a good question. You don't have to be sp spiritual. If you are spiritual, of course, it'll it'll take give you additional depth around some of those principles. But uh, it's not a prerequisite actually to to be good and nice and compassionate and empathetic. You know, when it comes to dealing with people in your corporate setup and being non manipulative, carry yourself with integrity and stuff like that. Those principles are there, which are taught to us in moral science as well, right? Now, if somebody, some people say that Bhagavad Gita is all moral science, I would say if you think Bhagavad Gita is moral science, you just need one shloka, chapter sixteen, verse six, verse three pretty much covers the entire moral science and much beyond that as well. Okay, You don't need Bhagavad. It's, it is much deeper science. It's not Bhagavad. It's like uh, simplifying and trivializing the message of Bhagavad Gita if you think it's purely moral science. It's moral science, yes, but much deeper message for that as well. Okay. Any more questions related to Guru or uh, anything pending? Uh, Ganpriya ji wanted to see the slide number three like related to attachment, the tool which you showed. Uh, related to attachment, you're saying? Okay. Uh, detachment. I think this is probably the third. Okay. Yeah, these are the culprits that we need to be very and cautious about. Okay, I see a couple of hands. Maybe we can spend a bit of time. Radhe Radhe Nanikji. Yes, Nanikji. Yes, Just true guru should be enlightened, not necessary. Yes, true guru, when you say enlightened, means he should be practically realized. That is the Brahmanisht. When we say Brahmanisht, Brahmanisht means he's enlightened. Shrotriya means he should be well versed with scriptures as well. And it's a redundant statement. Why? Because if you truly know the definition is enlightened is that the knowledge is revealed. So he one somebody who's enlightened um, has to be scripturally well versed. If you look at Guru Nanak Dev, Kabir Ji, they never read scriptures, but the truth is revealed from within. So they know pretty much everything, right? Because when you become God realized, uh, then you have access to pretty much everything. You are Satchit Anand at that point. And uh, the chit is is all the gyan is revealed in your heart itself. It's like download, full download that you get. So yes, a true guru, a true guru has to be enlightened. The one who can take you across this ocean of life and death. You can form a mentor in your life and guide in your life. They can help you become a better person. But a guru is the one who has the ability to take you across this ocean of life and death. Spiritual guru in this sense. 
Thank you, Nanik ji. Good question. Yes, Shambhai. Good to see you. I thought you're not going to be able to make it today. No, no. To me, thank you so much. Radhe, Radhe. Rahul, Radhe. Goodbye. No, I missed last this evening, I guess. There was no class yesterday, na? Okay. I, I don't join yesterday. Achha, make a question on Guru. Two uh, questions, in fact. Does uh, uh, the Guru has to be in his physical form? And secondly, if I choose a Guru, does he needs to know that I have chosen him or it's it's other way around? How does it go? No, it's a much deeper topic for I'll, I'll try to give you a quick one. The physical form, um, it helps to have a live guru who can resolve your doubts. Having said that, there are what do you do if you don't have it right? Still, if you have a precedence, you can make a guru. It helps, I would say. Okay. And probably not a prereq, I would say. What if you don't have enough karmas to meet a saint, then you know, saint may arrange for somebody, uh, but it helps to have a live guru, but uh, I haven't seen that. It's a prereq as such. Okay. Uh, you can ask that question to Swamiji. He has answered that. He said that the live guru always helps because he can resolve your doubts to your satisfaction. And secondly, it's a, it's, it's not a physical relationship where you get an, you know, you say, Hey, you are my guru. And you say, okay, now you are my shishya. And we shake hands and the deal is sealed, right? It's more at a deeper connection where you accept him in your heart and they accept you as well. Okay. Now, this, the, when the perfect relationship is established, when you start following the principles that have been laid out by the Guru, when you start, uh, you know, uh, practicing the Siddhant or the philosophy that they are preaching, then that relationship is it. But once you have accepted somebody from heart, that that is good enough. Um, you know, in, in uh, Bharat, there's a tradition that of initiation and stuff like that. That's when you say the relationship is established. Actually, truly speaking, it is not needed. Maharaj has spoken about that in great depth. It's so not needed. I you can choose a guru at my own free will and he might know, he might not know. I might so, tell guru would know. Might true guru would know. True guru would know that. Maharaj ji used to say, if you listen to even one of his lectures with an open heart and faith, he will accept you. Okay, on TV also. A true Guru is, you know, right? This Guru is God-like. <laughs> they are everywhere. They they just get you. It's not, they, they are not limited by our, like the intellectual uh, limitations we have or physical limitations we have. Okay, they are like divine. So for them, even if you're watching them on TV, they can capture your heart and they can establish, you can establish a relationship with them. So did so, it work like you you would typically think you know? Yeah, that, so yeah. Guru being Guru, he he will know that I have or somebody has chosen him. But how does one come to know that he the Guru has accepted him, or how does one feel after he has a Guru? Or how does one you, behave? You, or... you feel that is that once a connection is established, that keeps on getting reinforced in a lot of ways. You feel that pull to hear them, know them. Uh, and follow their teachings and start reaping the benefits from that association as well, right? I'm now guru. If he chooses, he may choose to. I mean, I've seen some now people depending upon your devotion and surrender. I mean, I've seen people who have said that they saw their guru in a remote place where they were not getting help, and they they were pretty sure it was their guru who helped them. You know, from nowhere somebody came and helped them out. So that is more of a you know your personal experience from beyond that point, but. You would know when your heart is getting, you know, tugged in a particular direction. And then the key thing is, it's not just about the guru. We have to have the qualification of a good disciple as well. When we start following the teachings and we start walking that path, then uh, your own experience will start strengthening that, reinforcing that relationship or that belief or that feeling. So it's a bit of a journey there. See, suppose if I see my personal experiences, I have been in certain situations where I know that it was it wasn't possible for a normal human being to help me out, which it is not one. I've got tons of instances in, in that way. So shall I assume that it was Guru, God through Guru or Guru through God helping me out? Possibly. You can then you meditate, sit down, pray to God and he'll reinforce that possibly, quite possibly. That's your personal experience though, but yeah, it is quite possible. But that connection, right, you have to keep it alive. That bhav, preserving that bhav, decorating that bhav, and, and following the teachings, that is the key. How would you prove to Guru that you are actually worthy of being a disciple? You have to walk the talk with regards to the teachings and be honest about it. Okay, getting a point, sort of. Okay, maybe one more, and then uh, I think uh, we are pretty much on time for the next yeah. segment as well. Yeah, Rahul. Nitinji, there is a question from Manisha ji on this guru topic. So I think that is an important one. 
So she mm-hmm. says about Ananita, how to maintain the Ananita, Ananita in the Guru. And the question is, how can we know that the time has come to change the Guru depending on your journey? As you discussed in one of the previous sessions that one can have two or three Gurus in life depending on their spiritual journey, like starting with the Gyan Mark, coming into Bhakti Mark. And there are also more than one Guru, though the teachings are same and helping us develop more Bhakti inside us. And because of the same teachings, we can follow them both but how to develop that deep attachment towards one guru. Okay, so I'll give a quick answer and then we'll have a longer yeah. discussion in the next one because we have, I think, two couple of minutes. I Not more than that I'll take. So one is uh, multiple gurus. Yes, there is scriptures don't prevent us from having changing your guru. Okay, only precondition there is that you should not have negative bhav towards the previous guru. Okay, so if you think, uh, it's like... If, if you are, let's say you go to a doctor and your whatever ailment you went there for is not getting cured, you don't say, you know, I'm stuck with this doctor. What to do? Now my ailment will not go. No, you change the doctor. So in case of guru, you don't have negative sentiment. You simply become neutral and move on. Okay, this is how scriptures tell us this. The second is ananyata is needed because if you don't have ananyata, then it's like multiple digging multiple wells. Maharaj used to say, once you have understood the Tattva Gyan, and it has made sense, and you have understood that, you know, the following the teachings is the way to go, then if you keep on listening to, okay, let me listen to this also, that also, that, he said it is Kusang. I don't know, it's a pretty strong statement. He said that becomes Kusang as well. So as long as you understand the teachings, take your time, do guru shopping, guru hopping, okay, follow your feelings and all the yardsticks and stuff, but once you do that, ananyata is needed for you to progress faster. Because if you'll not have an anatta, then you'll be like a little bit of there, a little bit of there. Ganga gay to Ganga Ram, Yamuna gay to Yamuna Ram, right? So that that will basically, uh, it's like a multi-branched mind and that will not take us far. I mean, especially if you want to fast track our journey quickly, that is a recommended principle. But it's a much more nuanced discussion that we can continue uh, in our next session. So thank you for asking that. With that said, I'll hand it over to Cash for our spiritual cash up segment. All yours. Thank you, uh, Radhe Radhe, everyone. And thanks, Parvyat, another week of this blessed opportunity. Could you hear me all this while? Okay. Um, thanks again for this blessed opportunity uh, to bring you some of Maharaji's teachings. So let's dive in. Um, I'll take you back to the time of COVID, not for long. But you remember how there were tons of all these disposable masks getting thrown off, right? So, on the other hand, you know, uh, you have this picture of rats who are thinking free hammocks all over town. It's like a miracle. So, the point here is one man's trash is another man's treasure. Granted, the mice are not men, but uh, you get the gist. So, this brings us to the topic for today. We're going to take an objective look at happiness. And when I say objective, it, I mean... Uh, a fact-based, logical, clinical look at happiness, but also objective in the sense of a goal. What should a real objective be in terms of happiness? And this, again, is to do with uh, the chapter Soul, Material World, and Detachment. And today we're looking at episode three. So moving on, um, to recap real quickly, <clears throat> excuse me, from where we left off last week, um, we talked in detail about uh, the tool of contemplation, Chintan. And we said this is an area where we definitely need um, some of that contemplation because we are we're absorbing divine knowledge, but we have to solidify that in many different ways. But Chintan is one of them, one of the tools that we can employ to do that. And that will help us cross that bridge over to the knowing or making that part of our experience. Um, and today, we'll try to dig more into this aspect of how we can further convince our intellect that material happiness is not the way to go. And then we'll also look at a perspective because uh, people bring up all the time, including last week, when someone was saying this all seems very difficult. It all seems like a lot of struggle. Um, and so let's look at our perspective on how can we keep persevering on our spiritual goals uh, and keep pursuing divine happiness, although it seems like it may seem like an insurmountable task. 
So let's dive right in to the nature of happiness and consequently sorrow, because it's a dichotomy. So Maharaji has a really beautiful analogy for this, which he explains in a very systematic way. Um, and I've kind of paraphrased that here. So let's say there's a person, right? And let's look at the different people in her life, so to speak. So of course, there's her family. Um, there's her friend, who she's pretty close to. There's her co-worker. Um, there's a neighbor, probably who lives in her apartment building, and she doesn't know him very well. Probably just a couple of hi's and hellos passing by. And then there's this one guy that she's loaned some money to, and he doesn't uh, intend to pay her back. Okay, so that's why he's a dishonest loan recipient. So these are the characters in our example. And now let's look at the legend. So where you see roses, that signifies happiness. And where you see dry twigs or thorns, that signifies sorrow. So let's take a scenario where this person unfortunately goes missing and she is presumed dead. So when this news reaches her family, of course, they're going to be uh, drowning in a you know, dry, twig, thorny bush of sorrow because they've lost a, a deeply, deeply loved family member. In contrast to that, her friend, she will be sad, but she probably won't be as sad as her family members. What about her co-worker? She will also probably be sad because she'll see a missing desk by where she's sitting. But again, she won't be as sad as the friend and definitely not sa as sad as the family. The neighbor that she barely knows, just probably by recognizes him uh, by his face, he actually probably won't even, it won't matter to him. He probably won't even notice. What about the guy who owes her money and didn't intend to pay her? He's going to be quite happy that you know she's no longer in the picture and he doesn't have to pay her back. So this is how it goes in this scenario. Then assume the person is found safe and sound and she returns to her family, right? In that case, they're going to be ecstatic. They're going to be so happy that the person they thought they're never going to see again is back. Her friend also is going to be very happy, but probably not to the extent that her family is happy. Her coworker is also, you know, she's joyful that her um you know, this person's back, but again, not as much as the friend or the family. What about the neighbor? He didn't even notice when she was gone. Probably won't notice when she's back. And then this guy who didn't want to pay back the money, he's going to be very sad indeed, because now he's got to pay up. Um, let's say a few months go by, right? This family has had a very happy reunion and everything. But now life goes back to normal. Mom's yelling at the kids because they're not studying or doing whatever they need to do. So then as, once a few months go by, they're still happy, but probably not as happy as the moment when they found out, okay, mom's not gone and she's coming back and she's here. So what conclusions can we draw from this example? So Maharaji says, when you look at this happiness and sorrow dichotomy, we get happiness and sorrow not from the object itself. It's not this person, but due to our relationship with that person. So the degree of whatever they felt was not because of the person, but how they related to that person. So that's why we said one man's trash is another man's treasure. It's not the object itself, but how you look at the object, how you feel about the object. Secondly, the degree of happiness each person experiences from that object is, is in the same proportion as the sorrow experienced when separated from that object. So if you see this sadness graph lowers, right? Because the family was closest to this person. And here the happiness graph lowers because they're the happiest to get, get this um, woman back. Thirdly, if an object does not bring any happiness, then it won't bring any sorrow either. So if you're indifferent to something, it's not, in, it's not inducing any positive or loving feelings inside us, then likely it's not going to 
induce any sorrowful feelings either. We're just indifferent to it. And lastly, the same object when consumed again and again gives diminishing happiness. This is true. This is all true about material happiness. Um, so, you know, in the case of this family, that moment when they met mom again, they their happiness was through the roof. And once things start to normalize a little bit, they chill back down. And then what are the Rasgullas doing here? Of course, if we're talking about diminishing happiness, I can't let that go without bringing our school in the mix. Um, once you keep consuming our school after our school, even if you love them so much, after your 10th one, you're going to be done. So this was um, our objective look at the nature of happiness. Moving on. So now we talked about a relationship to the object, right? Th that relationship can be of two kinds. One is a positive relationship and that we refer to as attachment. And the other one is a negative relationship and that we refer to as aversion. Um, aversion is when you don't want that thing or you don't want that person or you don't want that situation. It's the opposite of the attachment. So what we're saying is, if you have the object or the person that you are positively attached to, that of course is going to bring you happiness because you have what you want. If you don't have what you want, either object, person, whoever that is, if you don't have it, of course, that's going to bring you sorrow. But what about aversion? When you're averse to something, you're repelled by something, you feel good when it's not around you or it's not within your situation. So if you don't have it, that's when it's going to give you happiness. And if you get that situation or you're put with that person or you're put with that object, that's going to bring you sorrow. So it doesn't matter what kind of relationship we have to the object or the person. Um, either way, if we don't get what we want, it's going to result in sorrow. And if we get what we want, it's going to result in happiness. Um, so that's that's kind of the point here. Moving on to the nature of attachment. So Maharaji says attachment actually means absorption of the mind. So that could be either through love or hate, as we just saw. It's taking up your mind space. That's, that's the bottom line. So when there is neither attachment to love or hate, it's that indifferent kind of mood. That state is referred to as detachment or non-attachment. So the example he gives here is, let's say we want to buy shoes and we want to go to the shoe store. Likely on the way, you're going to see all these other stores, right? You're going to have to walk past all of them. So he says, you don't stop at each store and pick a fight with them to say, I don't want anything from you. Why, why are you here? What we do is we just ignore what's not uh, what we want and we just walk straight to the store that we want to. So he says, similarly, while walking through the marketplace of the world, we must neither love nor hate, but we have to make our way straight to the shop of God where alone, uh, where he alone is the center of divine bliss. So this is easier said than done, right? It's easy to do it um, here when you're just out shopping for shoes, but we know now that divine bliss is our objective and spiritual sadhana is where we need to focus our efforts. And yet it is hard to do, right? So why does this seem to be um, easier said than done. Why is it so hard to do? So let's let's kind of look at that. Maharaji describes an inner world and an outer world. So here we are as a person and we have this gross external world that um, we all have to deal with since we're here. But then in our minds, there exists a world of its own. In each of our minds, we have a separate world going on. And that's the inner world of desires. So the inner world is in the mind and it's full of subtle impressions which have been created since our countless um, lifetimes and our countless desires. This inner world is way stronger than the external world, Maharaji says, because it can create desires even in the absence of the external world. How? So for example, I will look at an example, but we desire an object because 
as we know, the mind is convinced that it will bring us happiness. It's our relationship to that object which is um, causing us to have that desire. So let's say you see a bag of chips in one of the grocery stores and that tempts you to buy it because you feel like that e eating a bag of chips will make you happy. Consider a scenario where you didn't see that bag or it wasn't in your external environment. But if you think about it in your mind, even if there's no external stimulus, the mind can still cook up desires and start thinking about that bag of chips. So much so that we start getting um, physical reactions from it too. So Maharaji says, God is infinitely big. I think we all agree with that. Um, we can't fathom anything bigger than God, right? But he says there's something even bigger than God. <laughs> um, so someone say mind, but okay, keep in your mind what you think the answer is and see for yourself if it matches or not. But what Maharaji says is bigger even than God is desire. And that's a scary thought. Um, so this does seem daunting, right? If we're full of desires and if desire is even bigger than God, if you go down that rabbit hole, then what do you do about it? Um, so here we'll leave this chapter and we'll segue somewhere else altogether. So stick with me. Um, let's look at an objective perspective. Let's put, put this all in a, in a perspective. So this creature here is called a mayfly. And this creature's claim to fame is being the creature with the shortest lifespan. So it, it's born and it's dead in one human day. That's its whole life cycle. A human, on the other hand, on average, will live for 80 years, right? That's roughly 29,000 days, Google says. I didn't calculate this. So one human lifetime is 29,000 mayfly lifetimes. Think about that for a second. So one lifetime that we live, a mayfly would have had 29,000 lifetimes to live within that same period of time. Now, if you look at our spiritual journey, we are here in our current lifetime and we're trying to work on our spiritual spiritual journey now here, right? But if you think about it, um, our scriptural knowledge says we have lived countless lifetimes since eternity. So I ran out of space on the slide to show that eternity. This is the best I could do. Um, these are all our past countless lifetimes and here we are in our current lifetime. So imagine the built-up depth and intensity of the conditioning, the tendencies and the desires, the stuff that we're dealing with. So of course, it's going to seem like a struggle at some point. But then what can we do about it? So here's a concept of playing the long game. What is the long game? It means to plan and do things that help us succeed in the future rather than focusing on the present or the near future. So it's like saying, this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. And in this case, it's a unimaginably long marathon. So playing the long game involves changing our mindset. We are used to getting immediate grat gratification. I do something, I see immediate results. But you have to get used to not having immediate gratification and not seeing visible results and just believing that some change is happening, knowing that some change is happening incrementally. That's a mindset change we all have to do. That involves breaking down the process. So if I cannot see the changes that are happening, how can I account for that incremental growth? I can break this process down into bits and define a daily goal and then start working on that daily goal. And once I check mark against that daily goal, day by day by day, I'm making some improvement although I know I won't be able to see immediate results right then and there. And our gurus tell us practice, 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 and practice patience, because this is a waiting game. Um, the long game also means that you're paying a small price today to get closer to our goal tomorrow. We could have used that time for something else, but we're choosing to say, no, I'm going to work on my daily goal today. And that's the price that we're paying. So examples from our daily life, if we want to start making a choice to eat healthy, for example, 
you have to build that muscle to say no to junk food or whatever else that we're used to and make that decision on a daily basis. This is what I'm going to choose instead. But then what happens? Day after day after day, when we start doing this, after a few months, we start to see and feel the benefits of that. Um, similarly, if you want to get physically fitness, uh, fit as well as, you know, similar, similar to physically fit, we start saving instead of spending, we'll see, um, you know, wealth growing. So these, these are some of the sacrifices and austerities we take on for better health or a better future. So that reminded me of um, one of Swamiji's SMX answers where this high school girl asked him, she said, I'm unwell and I have exams coming up and I'm so stressed, I'm unable to sleep and I don't know what to do. So Swamiji told her that you have exams coming up and it's your duty as a student to be, you know, studying and working hard on your um, studies and you have to take care of your health. So you see that you have some challenges going on right now. So right now is what he said is your period of austerity. So this is where you need to bring out some extra inner strength to overcome the challenge that you're facing today. And if you work towards that, it will feel better going forward. So why do I bring that up? Because it's the long game that involves compounding results. When we bring out that inner strength to make that decision every day, the longer we play the longer game, the bigger the rewards we're going to get. So going back to our, you know, that mayfly perspective, this is our spiritual journey, right? And these are our countless lifetimes. Those maybe we have spent in complete ignorance with all our desires and self-enjoyment. So why don't we look at this lifetime as our period of austerity? Because now we have the tatvagyan, we have the knowledge. Um, it's just a matter of putting it into practice. So um, that brings us to how to apply this knowledge to make it power. We know our long game is to go after the right kind of happiness, which is the divine bliss and not the temporary, limited, imperfect happiness of this world. However, um, in our experience, in our material experience, that's called protection. The limited material happiness is the protection for us because we directly perceive it using our senses. Anything that we deal with today that we think is going to bring us happiness actually does bring us happiness, even if it doesn't last for long. On the other hand, um, all this stuff which is on the divine side is paroch to us because uh, we cannot see it or experience it. It's not in our realization yet. That makes it difficult for us to say, how do I know I will get this divine bliss? Does it really exist? I don't see it. I don't experience it. So I start this paroksha by changing one letter, we can make it paroksha. And we've all taken exams or tests in some form or manner. Most of us have degrees, right? We've spent years studying and passing those exams before we even saw our degrees materialize or we even saw what that degree would do for us in terms of a career or where it would take us. But we put in the time and the effort to study and pass those exams anyway. So by doing bite-sized bhakti, one day at a time, we know they have compounding effects. I think we can all pass this ultimate test too. So I'll leave you with this last one thought. For spiritual self-effort, we have to do it today with no delay. The spiritual reward will get later, but it will be greater. And that concludes today's segment. Thank you so much for your patience and attention. Radhe Radhe. Thank you. Outstanding, Ash, like always. Power packed, a lot of stuff. When I look at your slide and the amount of thought and thought that has gone behind it, I feel, you know, each slide I can I can probably keep on speaking about for a week, okay? I don't know how you manage so much of thought, structure, and pack it all in 20-25 minutes. Um, Rupa ji, uh, Rupa ji, go ahead, please. But yeah, outstanding presentation. And then I think that uh, happiness, sorrow, and one man's treasure is other man's trash, or one man's trash is another man's treasure, right? This is how it works. The object do not have an happiness. I think these concepts which Maharaj ji has explained so simply and so beautifully, um, you have done justice to it by you know creating the visuals around it and bringing that structure to it, which I'm sure everybody's 
will be like they'll be blown away okay this this concepts itself are so powerful on top of it you are able to illustrate it visually so nicely so this is pretty outstanding i would say that yes rupa ji uh, radhe radhe everyone first of all i would like to really thank kanish ji and also uh, for the wonderful presentation any time i can give such a wonderful presentation in future in <laughs> near future i can say but really cash uh, and i have one question for cash ji uh, if you can show me the slides of the happiness and sort of the second slide in that uh, one point is a uh, bit a little bit confusing for me that negative and uh, positive happiness uh, something is there which is really confusing for me so can i just ask that question to cash in the meantime can you please uh, also fill out the feedback tracker for today's session uh, rahul we can post it again just, uh, yeah i need a little clarification on this uh, slide mm -hmm. yeah uh, the positive attachment and uh, so, negative aversion so let me just... ask you yeah. a question rupa ji okay you yourself answer it yeah. Tell me one thing okay. that you have a positive attachment to. Okay, now I'm going to put you on a spot. Positive attachment to means. Uh, okay, could be um, something that you eat. Got, uh, definitely it's towards limited to the food. Okay, let me not put you on a spot. What is the food? What positive? Okay, which food do you have a positive attachment for, which you'll relish or like to eat? Definitely sweets. Okay, sweets. And what is the food that you would not like to be served at all by anybody? i don't eat uh, non veg or something like so except okay, so that okay but you have a version to non veg okay fair enough now if you get sweets that is very a positive attachment if you get have you get happiness that is what this graph is mm -hmm. if you don't have it yeah. then you get sorrow oh my god they did not give and give a dessert okay i was hoping they would yeah. give right so you got a bit of sorrow there a version negative okay. if somebody feeds you non veg you will you will have sorrow so when you have something that you don't want then you get sorrow and when you don't get it it's like okay nobody gave you but it will be fine okay thank god at least they did not give me so this is what essentially this graph is about i hope that makes sense even i visualized in the same way nitin ji but i just wanted to get the confusion be clear even i i imagine myself in that way only but uh, once i felt uh, i may be wrong let me check that's what thank you for the clarity and thank you cash ji it was wonderful presentation god bless you thank you very nice thank you radhe 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 okay anybody else please do fill out the feedback tracker as well we can probably take a couple of more hands um before we wrap up our session yes uh, we number 7 i think that was rupa ji yes rahul go ahead radhe radhe outstanding presentation kesh ji and i just wanted to uh, make a small announcement about jk yuva grand launch will be have which will be happening tomorrow May thirty first at seven pm CST, which is five thirty am IST. So do check it out, and I have put the uh, links for the. I think there will be a panel discussion, and it will be live. So do check it out and uh, take the benefit of. Thank you, Rahul. Yes, that's an exciting event tomorrow. So the kind of treasure chest that you are creating, uh, Cash, uh, on this book, you should look at publishing it as a book. I'm telling you, it will be a hot seller, and. people would love it because these concepts are not ordinary concepts right um maharaj ji's prs and the way you are presenting it and think of writing a book i'm telling you it will be a hot seller and it will benefit a lot of people as well because reading and uh, getting such nice illustrations uh, you know that that will really help it uh, take it deeper for sure okay any more hands or anybody who wants to say something uh, you can create a supplemental read on that okay you on prs and that will be a very good handy book for anybody who's going who will get introduced to maharaji's philosophy okay let me have a help book around along with it as well to take that concept deeper all right um uh, number 7 i think uh, you have already spoken rupa ji i believe mm -hmm. yeah, radhe radhe rupa ji uh, do you want to write something or Okay, I think we have already covered. Anybody else? Everybody spell. Yeah, bomb. yeah, already mine is done. Okay. 
All right. So this is good. Mahesh ji, thank you. Uh, we see you on and thank you for turning on your camera. Where are you joining us from? Where do you join us from? I see you often, but it's uh, so nice to good, good to see I'm you. I'm in Potomac, Maryland. Okay. Thank you. I see you. And Induji has also turned on her camera. So thank you, Induji, for that. Pretty much all, all of you were able to turn on your camera. That definitely helps with engagement. And Miniji, you have to say something because you have taken a picture today in your camera. So you have to say something today about the exciting retreat that happened or otherwise. Please go ahead. Okay, well, someone is also raised. Yeah, Jashree Rabe, I think I have, my dream came true after so many years. And uh, this uh, best course of uh, um, LTP and the retreat, it was super hit. It was just amazing. And uh, I feel, you know, I am feeling so gratitude that I had live association of Maharaji. <laughs> and Swamiji, and now he's how he explained about the saints and about Maharaji, some of the things he said, you know, which I witnessed it myself, you know. And I have things in on the video, you know, sometimes, you know, I can show you all the Leela, you know, of Maharaji and Swamiji. That's it, Rade. Thank you, Minuji. Minuji is very inspirational and she's uh, an old timer devotee. So if you come to family camp, you will get the privilege of meeting her in person because I, I know Minuji will be there, right? So thank you. Yes, Samiran, go ahead, please. Maybe the last one. Uh, when uh, in the slide where Kashti showed the meter of life and the current life, the past life and the current life, and uh, she also said that uh, like bigger than God is the desire. So how a person would identify that the desires are coming from the past and past and past lives, but uh, and we are not generating it in this current life. You know, are you getting what I'm saying? Right. So, like, how would it matter, basically? There, is a, there are certain tendencies that you have a predisposition for, but what, what difference would it make to know whether it is coming from past life or my current life? How would it help, basically? Uh, maybe not uh, generating more of it. Or, uh, desire is not a desire, being... right? Desire is a desire. Now, if you come to know that it is coming from past life, then will you be happy that, okay, thank God, I have not generated a new desire. I'm only going by my past desire. How will it help, basically? I'm just trying to understand what is what is it that we will accomplish by knowing this difference, if at all we could. Uh, no, but because if, if, if something is uh, we are generating in this current life, uh, so it will not, uh, I feel, we will be able to catch hold of it that, we should not be uh, generating this thought or this desire in that sense. Regardless, is it so? No, regardless, like Krishna is not saying that hey, only the desires that you generate in this life are easier to handle than the ones that you generate you have already acquired from previous lives. All he's saying is that be mindful. Are you generating a desire? Calm, right? Kamat krodho bichayate. He says that because desire is like putting fuel to fire. You will never be able to satiate it. So why to build that to begin with is the key message to be taken from this uh, whole conversation or from a scriptural standpoint. And uh, Buddhism also says, you know, there is misery in this world. And then it goes on to say the, the cause of misery is desire. And the third noble truth is you finish desire. And the fourth is then if you, and you finish desire, you finish the misery as well. But on Bhakti Marga say, if you have to desire, desire in itself, not bad, as long as it is desire for the higher self, desire for God, desire for Seva, desire to improve yourself. Those are kind of good desires. If you, if it is anything other than that, then of course, whether it's coming from past lifetime because of our past sanskars or we are creating new sanskars because of our free will, it becomes a moot point at that point. The key thing is the quality of the desire is what we need to tackle regardless of where it is coming from. So we need to focus on that. And I don't think there's a formula to know that. You know, I mean, why would you, I mean, if you read yourself, is it your tendency from this life or past? Very difficult to know these kind of things. Infinite lifetimes we are talking about here. Okay. Um, 
maybe one okay let's take two hands and then before 10 10 we will wrap up yes manranjan ji you are going to tell us the kabir ji is doha please go ahead namaskaram namaskaram radhe 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 today i'll tell you a sutra since your topic was uh, detachment mm -hmm. uh, adi shankara is saying sasangatve nisangatvam nisangatve nirmohatvam निर्मोहत्वेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडेंटेडे
Uh, so Sunday evening, Monday morning, I look forward to seeing you back. So Radhe Radhe, good night, good day from my side. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, Radhe Radhe, thank you, Nitin Ji. And I shared the book launch video here for those of you who missed it. It is available on YouTube. Radhe Radhe. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Fush. Good. All right, Radhe Radhe, good night, good day, everyone.